back. We are resuming our conference, and uh, we will have now the panel discussion among uh, judges of the courts. Uh, the topic of the discussion will be uh, autonomy of the EU law and common constitutional traditions, interplay between EU courts and national courts. And let me now introduce this very esteemed panel. Uh, Mr. Regilas Levitz, who is currently judge at the Court of Justice of European Union. He is also an honorary professor of Rio Graduate School of Law. He has been also a um, judge at the European Court of Human Rights, uh, as well as he has chaired a, a constitutional law committee created by the President of Latvia and uh, has given advices on questions of international law, constitutional law, and legislative reform to our parliament. Um, we have Professor uh, Ineta Ziemele. She is the president of Constitutional Court of Republic of Latvia and also a professor, uh, professor of public international law and human rights at Riga Graduate School of Law. Uh, Ms. Ziemele has also served as a judge at the European Court of Human Rights and was elected as a president of the Chamber of the Court. Uh, she graduated from the Faculty of Law of University of Latvia and was awarded master's degree in law by University of Lund, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute, as well as awarded PhD by the Cambridge University. Uh, in 2001, Ineta Zimmel established an international legal journal, Baltic Yearbook of International Law, which will be also a publishing volume of, of proceedings from this conference and continues to be its editor-in-chief. And then you see also in our panel discussion Inga Reine, who, with whom we had a very challenging and engaging discussion yesterday, so we can continue uh, today. Uh, Inga is a judge at General Court of the European Union and uh, has also held several uh, go uh, government positions at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia, including being representative to European Court of Human Rights, and also advisor and head of the division at permanent mission of Latvia um, to the EU. So, honorable panel members, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, uh, thank you for the invitation here. I will say only some words about common constitutional traditions and how the European Court of Justice is uh, dealing with that. Common constitutional traditions of the member states uh, is one of the sources of European law. Um, it is an unwritten source but uh, we have to deal in specific uh, constitutional situations with uh, this uh, specific source. Uh, traditions as such are rather soci sociological facts, but we should, be, before uh, applying these soci sociological facts, it is necessary to, um, to consolidate different uh, constitutional traditions from, in principle, 28 member states. And this consolidation uh, of um, common constitutional traditions is one uh, judicial and also intellectual task, because each uh, member state has uh, their own traditions, but a common tradition to develop, to say this is a common tradition, it is um, uh, one level uh, uh, um, above that. Uh, it is necessary to, um, to consolidate these different uh, facts, different um, traditions. Uh, I should also add that some member states, maybe the majority of the member states, but a lot of uh, member states, has um, they don't have this uh, notion, legal notion, constitutional tradition. For example, in Latvia, to say, to speak about constitutional tradition of Latvia, it's possible, but it is not very uh, developed notion uh, uh, which Latvian constitutional court is applying. I don't know. Slowly. We have? It's coming. Uh, you have it's referred coming. to that? Yes. Yeah, now. Yes, yes. So, of course, uh, but... Uh, 
uh, there are other member states where the notion, constitutional tradition, I'm speaking on national constitutional tradition, is uh, rather developed and it is uh, on the same level known for all uh, lawyers like, like law, for example. La law, constitutional tradition and other sources. Um, this is one maybe difficulty, I would say not a very important difficulty, but uh, it is a, so a, a theoretical difficulty to, uh, when we are dealing with constitutional traditions. Um, then for the European Court of Justice, uh, the rather challenging uh, job is to consolidate the different uh, constitutional traditions, even in some member states this notion is not very known or not very used. And so to say, to take the example of Latvia, in Latvian constitution and constitutional literature, uh, this is not mentioned, but if we are from the point of view of European Court of Justice trying to, uh, to, uh, to find these uh, common traditions, we should uh, establish also, what is the constitutional tradition in Latvia? Despite that the Latvia, in the Latvian law, it is not common to establish such tradition. Um, so, uh, in principle, common constitutional traditions and natural uh, source of law, because European community uh, community, European Union now is a union of states with similar constitutional uh, order, similar, not the same, but similar. And the similarity consists of two levels. The ground level is not similar, but should be the same. The same, that means uh, all, uh, there is a um, um, level of uh, homogeneity between all member states, and this homogeneity is, um, um, means common European values, which are established in Article 2 of the Treaty on, uh, of uh, European Union. And this common values should be the same, also homo homogeneity between all the member states. And if, for example, in a theoretical case, we would, we would fi uh, find, uh, fi uh, find out that in one member state, one of these uh, values is not relevant or not existent, then we can say, oh, there is a problem. And uh, maybe with uh, all the consequences uh, uh, what, uh, what, would be, what would follow on that. So this is a level of homogeneity, and then the level of di diversity. Um, because uh, there is a common model of uh, constitutional order, and we are normally calling this um, democratic constitutional state, not only democratic, but democratic constitutional state. And democracy is one of the values, but not... not um, uh, not the only values. For example, uh, it's very important for this uh, model is that uh, democracy is restricted by rule of law. Uh, so, um, so that uh, the com uh, com uh, common constitutional traditions, if we are looking into that, uh, we can uh, we we can uh, find out uh, the homogeneous uh, level and also the level of diversity. And to consolidate this, this in one, in a specific case, what we need uh, in one uh, principle, what is this uh, co uh, tra traditions, I think uh, we, uh, um, we uh, should develop, and we have some, but we should develop more precisely a certain uh, me uh, methodology. I think we should discuss this methodology. I will tell you what is what we are doing in Court of Justice till now. Um, one source to consolidate a co uh, common constitutional traditions 
as the judges themselves. The judges uh, are um, uh, com uh, coming from 28 member states, and they know from their education that um, what is uh, the fact and what are the principles, constitutional principles, in, in uh, the respective member state. So that I think it's, it's, uh, it is the first, first step um, which we are doing is to discuss between the judges which are involved in a specific case what is the situation in your country, what is the situation in, in my country, and then we can, uh, I would say, in a, on the basis of this uh, discussion to, to appreciate what is the common level, co uh, common level, what is the common tradition. And it is informal, uh, informal uh, way to find out uh, this um, tradition. The second, as a more sophisticated, is if it is a relatively complicated issue uh, or more important issue, then uh, we have a research department at the court. And in the research department of the court, uh, uh, there are, uh, there are, are um, lawyers from all member states which uh, we, and, uh, we, which uh, know the legal system of the respective country. And then um, there is a specific decision of uh, the court that in a, in a case it is, uh, we uh, would ask the research department to find out the constitutional situation in the member states. It is not, uh, not the decision of the juge rapporteur, but it's a, a decision of the Assemblée Générale, uh, from the, uh, also from all judges, including judges which are not participating in the, in the case. It's a general decision. Um, so that means a certain, uh, certain bureaucratic uh, this decision, why it is not so easy, because uh, also one, one reason it is that the research department, uh, the capacity of the research dis the, uh, department, and the second reason, and to, to have this decision, the juge rapporteur should reason why it is absolutely necessary to, no, absolutely necessary, why it is necessary to have this report. So after this decision, uh, the research department uh, prepares uh, this um, report, maybe so several weeks, I will, it would take several weeks, and there is, in this report, is a relatively serious report with the situations in all or most member states, I would say not all, but most member states, maybe 20, 15, 20, from 28, some, and sometimes also in all 28 member states, but not always. Uh, and then there is a, a, a um, synthesis of uh, what is the, uh, the common situation in, in the member states, so that um, on the basis of this report, which uh, we have as judges, then we can say, oh, this is a common constitutional tradition in the member states. And then we are dealing further in our judgment uh, already on the basis of uh, this report. Um, this is a method how to find out till now. But uh, there is, uh, we have also discussed in, in, in the court uh, between judges that it is now maybe not enough or not uh, sophisticated enough uh, this way to find out the common traditions. Uh, why it is not enough? Uh, because of uh, course um, the lawyers of the member states by, by this report know more or less uh, the constitutional situation, uh, but in few pages to describe a mer maybe a very complicated issue is uh, 
no, is normally is not uh, going deep enough. Uh, more or less, uh, if we are reading that, we can uh, there are uh, reflections about the constitutional texts. On the text level, we can see uh, what is uh, written down in the constitution, maybe in some laws, and then some uh, some abstractions. But you know that the constitutional issues are much more deeper. And I would not say so uh, directly, but uh, I would say maybe it's not deep enough, <laughs> this uh, report. And uh, especially when uh, a constitutional issue in a member state is disputed or not decided, uh, this is a real problem there is maybe in the literature there is one side there is other side but the constitutional court the court has not taken this, this uh, decision this issue yet so and um, it is a good uh, help this report but maybe it's not enough there was we had discussed yesterday with some colleagues um, because there was an idea to publish uh, with reports. Uh, it was an idea which uh, was put forward on the FIDE Congress in Budapest two years ago. Uh, so, in principle, on the, our first re reaction was, yes, why not? But uh, after reflection, we, have, we, 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 we got some uh, hesitations. Because uh, then, if it is published, it should be um, it should be uh, uh, written as uh, accordingly as complete as possible, as possible uh, written uh, accordingly to all academic standards with mm -hmm. references and so. Because then, this report is exposed to the critique, and for. For the court in this specific situation, it is uh, relatively dangerous because the court is taking uh, uh, in account this report or intellectually taking account. There is no reference, but take a, takes account this report. And there could be a critique, but you have not uh, really uh, res the research was, was a little bit superficial and one uh, constitutional court decision is not uh, mentioned and so far and so far. That means if we would uh, prepare such kind of academic uh, report which we can publish and to expose uh, this to academic critique, of course it would uh, take much more longer and uh, there we would need much more resources for that. So I don't know what will be the result at the end, because there is no real decision to publish or not, but uh, I, I uh, said that there is some arguments for, and maybe also in my view, a little bit heavier arguments against the publication. So, and then that is, that is the situation till now. Um, but uh, we should think about how to, um, how to develop this methodology. And uh, I would say also a natural uh, way is to, to have a contact with national authorities, especially constitutional or supreme courts. Um, or to have uh, some kind of institution as an inter-court inter institution where it is possible to uh, ask the question about common constitutional uh, traditions. Uh, thus, uh, such ideas exist. Um, the, in my view, the advantage would be uh, that of course, the best knowledge about the national tradition has the National Constitutional Court um, or Supreme Court in, in a member state where uh, there is no constitutional court. But uh, till now, there is no possibility to involve 
this court in court proceedings. That means we should uh, change our procedure mm -hmm. if we would uh, involve that. Um, I think there is not there, it is not necessary to change the treaty. It would be enough to to change uh, our uh, statutes or or uh, procedural rules, so to say. Uh, I am not 100 percent sure, but 99 percent sure that the change of uh, the treaty is not necessary. Um, that means it's already easier, and. Um, this should be discussed also between the constitutional courts because it is idea. Some constitutional courts, uh, the Latvian especially, uh, has uh, thought about that. But maybe for other constitutional courts in Europe, it's a new idea. Um, therefore, uh, it would be uh, advisable to have a common uh, exchange of uh, ideas or in a conference on a, or a different way, what uh, do you mean about this kind of involvement of national constitutional courts by, uh, by the um, appreciation of common constitutional traditions? Of course, if we have more or better uh, informations or appreciation of national situation in different member states, uh, anyway, uh, um, the task to consolidate this as an intellectual task, a judicial, a theoretical task, it remains. And it, it would uh, be rather uh, the task, like, like, like now, the task of the, um, of the European Court of Justice, but on the basis of better and more precise information of all member states and uh, informations with authority. Authority, that means from national constitutional courts. Um, and this task could be uh, on the first, so to say, auxiliary level done maybe by the research department if, and then of, uh, in the, on the decisive uh, level by the court, by the formation for the judges which are uh, sitting on the specific case. But uh, the basis for this consolidation would be uh, much more better. Um, then I will stop uh, now, but only one, one sentence. There is also a problem that uh, a constitutional, the constitutional situations in different member states may be are, uh, rather different, or maybe in 20 member states the solution is on one side and in eight member states on the other side. Uh, this is a, not a problem of information, but this is a problem of uh, theoretical consolidation, how to, uh, how to um, say what is the common tradition. The common tradition should be common by all member states or by all member states minus one or by majority or for by big majority. So it's also a question. Uh, it's, it's, it, now it's open and uh, we are not very, uh, so to say, precise how we are doing now that, but if we would develop a more sophisticated methodology, we should also um, approach this issue, but how, uh, but what um, the number of member states where such a, a tradition exists. And this is also a question of sovereignty and question of political power. For example, if we are saying common tradition is only then common when in all member states exists such a tradition, uh, then of course uh, the, the principle of sovereignty prevails because the uh, situation in a member state could be managed, could be decided by national constitutional court. And if a national constitutional court is deciding in a specific way, 
So then it is, which is which differs from 27 and other member states. Then of course um, we cannot say there is a constitutional tradition, and that means with the all consequences what follows from that. That means uh, there could not be a European decision on this issue because there is no common constitutional tradition, and the issue is decided by national authorities, by national courts, national constitutional courts. If we are saying majority, or maybe in some member states also it's possible, then of course uh, the, pop the proportion or the political weight of the European Court of Justice, and that means of the European law, and that means of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis national state, national legal system, national constitutional court, is uh, giving, uh, so to say, more weight to, uh, to the European level. Also, this is, uh, first, we would say this is a theoretical, methodological issue, but with, uh, I would say, rather important also political consequences. So I would stop here, and we can soon discuss uh, later. Thank you. Um, I will maybe, uh, thank you, Egil. Uh, I will maybe pick up um, on a couple of points of what you have said and add uh, a couple of more elements to, again, contextualize uh, a little bit the relations between the national courts and a European court. Uh, I will maybe uh, first uh, address a couple of very precise points that you have mentioned, uh, and specifically the document pre prepared by the research doc uh, in the format of, of a judgment in a, in a particular case. I would agree because we also have access and, and we study. These are very interesting documents to understand the national practice, but they are very dry. I would agree that in terms of publication, they are not very informative. This is just a, a very draft, short. I would yeah, say, yeah, it's a, it's a draft that gives a very brief, very dry, very succinct information of what the national law says. And uh, sometimes what we note, because of course we read this, uh, this draft, especially in, in, in my office, from the perspective of our, our national law to see what we may learn new. And sometimes what is uh, peculiar about this document, I can't say that uh, it's in 100% cases because I simply don't have that statistics, I don't know. But what is interesting, uh, that sometimes the the approach that we take, uh, and again, this, this is something to think about, uh, that the reply is simply yes or no. Well, there is a law, there is no law. And sometimes when I read it, I ask myself a question, well, but what if a state, a given member state, has an alternative that is neither yes nor no, but something different? How would that information be relevant in a particular context. Uh, but this has nothing to do with the, with, the, with the search for a common denominator, but rather a more general reflection that not always it is possible to say the tradition is this or that. Because the traditions, as I, as I said yesterday, they may be common, but they may not be necessarily identical. So they may be very close to each other, but the, the, the very precise implementation of that tradition may vary a little bit. So how do we deal with this situation? We're not far away from each other, but we're not identical either. Um, and, and this, I think, is, is extremely interesting. And again, if there is a discussion on the role of constitutional courts, uh, this is, I think, something where uh, the highest courts, maybe the constitutional courts or the, Sup the Supreme Courts, could be mostly useful because they can contextualize whatever information is relevant because they know the, the substance, they know why this is so or why this is, this, this is, there is nothing there. Asking information from national authorities, I can say that I have, uh, as, as the government agent at the time before Strasbourg Court, I know Strasbourg Court is also using the, the reference to the national uh, legislation and their uh, twofold uh, approach. There is some information that is gathered directly by the court, and uh, there has also been a rather uh, elaborated uh, cooperation system between the government agents when the governments wanted to make as part of the defense system an argument that, look, the, the national traditions, this is not only us, 
this is a more general context that national traditions come into play, uh, which I think is also, first of all, a source to explore on the one hand, because this is something that the governments or the referring courts can do themselves, exchanging information because they know the national practices. And we did have an alert system at the time between the agents saying, well, I have a particularly interesting case that may turn around the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg court. Why don't you say something about your constitutional tradition? We will put it as part of the defense or as a part of, a, of, a, uh, of an information point. Uh, but the, the downside of all this process, again, this is first time consuming, and second, it does not guarantee a response. You may get a response from all member states, you may get a response from five member states, you may get a response from three member states, then, but at least this is something. I mean, you can, you can use it, but this does not guarantee a result in itself. Um, but speaking of uh, the importance of this matter, I would maybe like to bring it back to the discussion that we just had before this, the, before this panel this morning on the need to address the court, whether the court can be overburdened by the preliminary rulings. Yes and no, because if the court does not know what questions arise at the national level, the court may not see what are the, the lacunas or what are the problems with the interpretation. And I wouldn't be too afraid of overburdening the court because I, I think the court has various tools in its, uh, in its, uh, uh, in its use that, that can be triggered at one point or another. Uh, and I, I dare to say one of the ongoing discussions, this is again the, the repartition uh, uh, and the new delegation of competences, the repartition of competences between, between the two instances and the issue of at least some preliminary rulings and the infringement proceedings is always uh, on, is still on the table, I understand. So there is room for maneuver, and this is not the question that today or tomorrow we will have 3,000 applications that we will not know what to do. But why is it important is, um, again, even the issue of supremacy is not written in the treaties. Uh, for one reason or another, uh, it's, uh, but, but the principle is there. But on the other hand, uh, we know very well also the, the very developed case law that if the lowest court have very wide margin of discretion of whether to ask the question, then the higher the case goes in the national system, the more narrow this margin of appreciation become. And I think the constitutional courts who would eventually become the last instance in one case or another would then be locked in a situation that either we rule or we ask. And I don't think it should be uh, difficult to, well, it, it may be difficult to ask, but I still believe in the necessity of asking a question um, because this is how we can see the, the interaction between the constitutional tradition, because the constitutional court would not simply rule on the merits of the case or would not even rule on the merits of the case. The, the constitutional, the primary task of a constitutional court is to say what the national constitution foresees. And how can that decision be given without an informative, uh, a substantial dialogue on what the national laws, or what the European law foresees? And if we put it again in the context of what uh, uh, an, a number of constitutional courts have said, and we know that the German constitutional court have said it, uh, has said it, we know that the French, uh, what was that, I think it was Conseil d'État, uh, it was the Italian constitutional court that ruled that all, in the case of a direct conflict between a constitution uh, or a national constitutional tradition and the European law, they have put in their national system a kind of a brake paddle to say, well, then we will look first on the principle of conferral. And if the principle of conferral has, is, has not been there, they say, well, then we can say that, that uh, the, the European law is against the Constitution. But how can you say that, I'm not saying this is a correct approach, because on the contrary, the, the case law of the Court of Justice foresees the possibility to say that even the Constitution is not in accordance with, with, the, national, uh, with the European law. But 
even if we are to assume that, that this tradition, national tradition, is there, and we know of one Czech case uh, where uh, the Czech uh, Constitutional Court they ruled that the, the judgment of the Court of Justice was ultra virus, if the idea is there, then you can't give an informative reply without establishing the, the limits, the scope of and the interpretation of the European law. And against this background, I, I want to add another element. Uh, so far, this is very limited case law that the Court of Justice has. And we still don't have a final reply, but we have uh, at least three cases. We have Kobler case, we have uh, Ferreira da Silva case, and we have the recent uh, Bulgarian case where the Court of Justice ruled that in case of a violation of a European law by the national court, there must be a right for compensation. Well, there you go, and it goes very well with the discussion that we had this morning. We don't know yet how and whether that right has ever materialized, because in Kobler case, it was just that the, the, the material conditions are not there, so the issue has been excluded already at the level of Luxembourg. In the Ferreira da Silva case, the court said, well, this is the case where the national authorities, where the national court has violated the European law, but we have just checked uh, yesterday, uh, last time, whether we have received a reply from uh, Portuguese authorities how the case ended up at the national level. We still have no reply, so we don't know. But this, the issue is there. And for the system to function, and again, going back to what we discussed, it can't remain in a closed bubble because it all boils down to the fact that the law is been is been done for for individuals. And um, I just look at my at my uh, colleagues at, at the national level. Uh, one thing is uh, it's not only that the court rules on a case. Um, I have just found uh, an example with the assistance of my colleague. Is just. It can also be the situation when the court refuses to rule on the case. Uh, for example, um, we have just had recently uh, a decision by the Supreme Court in Latvia, which I find a, a very excellent example of how things may be problematic, where the Supreme Court, so this is the last instance on the case, yes, um, refused to um, uh, declare the case inadmissible, that clearly relates to the European law, being very well of, of aware of the fact that in other member states, uh, well, the, the, the substance of the case that na uh, Latvian national law foresees higher admissibility threshold for some cases that are relating uh, to the European law than the, the European Court of Justice foresees. And in that context, the applicant was trying to contest one of the decisions. Uh, I think it is a, yes, it's a competition case. And the national court being very well aware that the national threshold is higher for admitting the case than what the European law foresees for the cases before the European court, that in other countries, and it's all part of the text of the decision, that in other countries, uh, the issue, at least in some countries, the issue has been resolved and the threshold has been brought on the same level as the European threshold. Knowing all that, being aware of all of that, and without asking the question to the European Court of Justice, the Supreme Court decided to reject the case. And I think this is an example of why this dialogue is necessary. Because then the law does not exist in a vacuum. The law is meant for people, and the European law, the basis of the European law, is internal market. This is addressed to individuals. This is addressed to businesses. And if we're putting a cap in such a way, then something isn't, I'm, I'm, in my view, something isn't right. And um, I, I pass on this discussion because there could also be an option to ask the constitutional court whether we can be immune from that uh, requirement. Or a question could be asked the European court whether we can be immune from that requirement. But it was neither nor. Voila. Full stop, what shall be done? Um, and by looking at those examples, and I think only through the concrete examples that we can see why this is necessary. So I'll stop here. Well, thank you. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much to judges uh, Levitz and uh, Reine. And, um,
I will try to provide um, indeed a national um, constitutional perspective uh, on uh, a number of issues, but probably on a more broader debate that you had uh, since yesterday. Um, I was actually wondering, uh, when Egils was talking about uh, common constitutional traditions uh, in the European Union, and indeed it is a source of law, but I do wonder uh, whether we shouldn't um, ask ourselves a question of the broader meaning of common constitutional traditions. There is um, evidently um, sort of a sociological, a political uh, dimension to this notion. Um, and by answering that, in fact, we get also to more specific questions on uh, methodology. Because as you were asking the question, is it one state, is it few states, um, sort of how do we, uh, what's the threshold for the number of states to be able to identify a common constitutional tradition? And as Inga was saying, is it identical tradition or similar tradition? The analogy that came to my mind was international law, of course. <laughs> sort of rules of customary international law. That was my analogy. But there, I immediately asked the question, within the uh, supranational context, within the idea of European Union and the integration that we want to achieve, although there are lots of disagreements, but it's sure that we want to move forward, right? Um, the analogy of international law probably would not work. You see, that's sort of just for, for, for the reflection. And it is therefore that in my mind, it is very important to reflect on broader meaning and understanding and effects and the role of common constitutional tradition. Now, having said that, uh, I would provide you with a a few points that uh, come to my mind. Um, I'm really struck in this um, discussion between the Luxembourg courts and the uh, constitutional courts or Supreme Courts having constitutional jurisdiction. I'm struck by a, a number of, um, of, of sort of points and attitudes. Uh, and they, they belong to where we are uh, in, the, in the development of, uh, of well, European civilization or broader. Because you see, um, we are examining the issues that you were just raising from the uh, uh, perspective of the notions of the 19th century and the 20th century. Because the intellectual frameworks within which we reflect are state, state sovereignty, supremacy. Supremacy of the legal system for us means sovereignty. And these are the intellectual frames within which we examine something that is in the future. Now we have to be very much aware of that. And so, um, my, the, the, the point I always make in this discussion, in this competitive discussion between the EU courts and the constitutional courts is, well, you know, unless you accept that you are looking through the lens of the late 19th century <laughs> to this, this competitive discussion, we will remain in that competitive mode. Now, we really have to admit that the world has changed. Not only because we do have a supranational um, legal order, I would even say a supranational culture of sorts, but also at an international level, things have changed. It is therefore that we really need to sort of look uh, well, we can't be, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gelsons or Hards or Dworkins of 21st century. We should strive and we should provide for new uh, theories, but at least try to adjust what we know and what we have to these uh, changed 
circumstances. And as I said, what I see is that there are um, sort of, uh, com that there is a competition between EU law supremacy and the supremacy of constitutions. That the elephant in the room is that. And it is therefore that you have the interesting uh, debate between the German Constitutional Court and uh, your court. Um, you also have there all sorts of dimensions. Um, there are, for example, in that same mode of competition, I would put uh, my former court, the European Court of Human Rights, and its uh, uncertain attitude to the United Nations, for example. So there is, we are still living in this, this, this competition uh, of who has the last word, who is more supreme than the other. And we really need to deal with that. Now, um, my what next. Will you propose that? <laughs> I will have a proposal. <laughs> I am identifying the problem. Now, um, I am still fascinated. I keep repeating, I, I keep uh, sort of um, uh, quoting uh, that case because. Um, of course, um, uh, uh, Judges uh, Levitz and, and Reina were very careful and diplomatic um, about your presentations. But of course, you can also find within the debate of the European, uh, of the Court of Justice, a more sort of um, um, kind of, um, there, there is a certain vision and a more forceful positions, and one of these uh, cases or one of these instances where in my mind a certain vision was proposed uh, for the, the, the next steps to be taken by the uh, Court of Justice was uh, uh, the, uh, the Advocate General's opinion in Gorweiler case which I think is important to discuss, you know, and what the uh, Advocate General said, more or less you know it, but uh, uh, his idea was that, in fact, we do have uh, uh, a common uh, um, sort of culture, constitutional culture within the European Union, and uh, that uh, common constitutional culture is part of the common uh, identity, of the European Union. And then the next point he asked was, so how different are the constitutional identities of the member states and the constitutional identity of the European Union? And his conclusion was that they are not so far away from each other. So in the light of this discussion that you've had, my question is the following, and that brings me back to Egil's point on common constitutional tradition and how do we conceptually understand it. So my question really is about diversity. My question is about the diversity and do we need it? Or do we just sort of uniform everything? Do we need the diversity? And that brings, uh, comes back to uh, your favorite advisory opinion <laughs> to 2013, right? Um, where the court came very close to saying we really do not need constitutional diversity. Now, um, I believe that uh, constitutional diversity within the European Union is needed. I think it is still a driving force of the European um, integration project, one of the many driving forces. I would say that uh, the diversity, along with the work of, of both courts, are the main factors that are the driving forces for the kind of European uh, Union that we want uh, to see. Um, and in order to accommodate this diversity, not to fear it, but to accommodate, there are several things that need to be done. And uh, this is why uh, in my introductory remarks to the uh, uh, conference, and I've uh, repeatedly said it on, um, on many occasions by now, that um, by looking at various uh, schools of legal thought, uh, I have myself identified constitutional pluralism as the potential sort of frame for thinking, for accommodating 
the uh, common, common constitutional tradition that the Court of Justice would like to consolidate, and the diversity that is necessary, uh, I believe, at least history of human race sh shows that diversity is necessary for new ideas, for progress, um, and for uh, a, a more democratic and legitimate, uh, I would say, uh, uh, way forward. So the, the constitutional pluralist vision is, first, that we should really step away from uh, the idea of uh, um, um, supremacy, uh, and rather think how do we conceive uh, the dialogue and the, the mutual, <laughs> mutual respect and mutual synergies approach between the various legal orders. Um, if, you, if you want, uh, I mean, that sort of has been already uh, voiced uh, for last at least uh, 15 or, or 17 uh, years. But instead of putting an emphasis on supremacy, I'm not saying it should be abolished, but instead of sort of uh, starting all of the discussions with the supremacy point of view, rather change the emphasis and look at mutual synergies and based on mutual respect between the EU, sort of what is within the EU, comp EU competence and where the constitutional, national constitutional tradition sort of comes in and, uh, and caters for uh, certain uh, development. Um, if the pluralist uh, vision is the one, is the, the frame for further reflection, then um, I believe uh, indeed uh, European courts and uh, constitutional or supreme courts have um, a very important role to play. Um, and I believe that it is these actors that can provide for a constructive way forward. Because politics will be there. We know um, there are differences between the big players and not so big players within the European Union. We leave them to that. But as far as the courts are concerned, uh, we certainly can uh, uh, find sort of common understanding of those notions that are very important for the uh, pluralist vision on the development of the, of the European law. And why do I think we should really find um, a voice for constitutional courts in the adjudication of the cases in European Union courts, coming back to where uh, Egils was? Um, there is one uh, important issue. It is also the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the entire exercise. Not just the fact that there is this tradition or that tradition which is important for the development of the EU law, but what we really want, and it's been uh, uh, an issue for long, for as long as EU has existed, uh, and that's the uh, issue of legitimacy of that exercise. Now, uh, what we have not really reflected until now is the fact that national courts on equal uh, sort of footing in solving the EU uh, law issue would add considerably to the legitimacy quest of both that particular adjudication, but also the bigger uh, EU uh, uh, integration uh, project, um, as far as um, I can see. And yes, I, I fully agree. I think it's, the, uh, it's your methodology, your actually working methods, because we are ready. <laughs> we can provide you with <laughs> a legal analysis. But uh, it is really uh, opening up uh, on, on the Luxembourg side, uh, adjusting the way you draft judgments with all due respect, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the input that goes into arriving uh, at the judgment, and that is all really in this uh, equal footing, mutual synergies, pluralist vision um, uh, of, of, the, of the development of European constitutionalism, I would say. So these are my reflections. Thank you.
judges. Now it's time for, for questions from audience. May I uh, add uh, one? Okay. No, only one sentence. I think that um, I think uh, the problem here is, or uh, the direction in which we should uh, uh, ask for for solution is how to uh, constitutionalize and institutionalize the national input into creation of European law, and. Uh, there is there are some ways, and we should discuss that uh, in order to have a common constitutional space to develop cons common constitutional space uh, yes which is this consists of both European level and national level so mm -hmm. proposals how to mm -hmm. to 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 uh, precise and to to create maybe this input ways. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have some ideas. <laughs> well, uh, thank you to all three speakers for three excellent presentations and thought provoking. So, um, but I would I would have many questions, but I will pose two. Um, one goes to um, Judge Levitz. Um, I was struck by um, one of your very first sentences where you said that common constitutional traditions are a source of EU law. And I was struck because I have always been taught and I teach my students that the source of EU law is um, EU general principles and these are drawn from common constitutional traditions. Now, this is not just nitty-gritty academic question. It's, uh, it's important, I think, because there is also the element of the autonomy of EU law in that. And it also comes out in, well, as, as you explained, it's not a mathematical exercise of is it 28, 28 minus 1, etc. No, it's a sense of, it's an exercise that the, the court does uh, in order to establish what the EU general principle is. Now, I think it is important because it lowers the stakes also. And it's, it lowers the stakes for the court to ex uh, maybe as an explanation of why the notes de recherche are not made public. Um, and um, so it could be used as an explanation for this is just an exercise when establishing EU general principles and not, we're not doing a mathematical exercise. So that would be one, and I would like to hear your view on that. But, but, and I think it is important to keep the idea of the autonomy of the EU in general principles because of the question of, and I have always believed that common constitutional traditions feed into the EU general principles, right? So that it is, there is an openness between the two. But the question can be, or should never become, can common constitutional traditions backslide in the same way that national constitutions can. So say, if we look at what, what is happening in Hungary and Poland and possibly also in other countries, could that infect EU general principles? If you keep it completely open, it could. If you stick on the autonomy, it could not. Um, and then my question to um, Jet uh, Zimmerle would be, yes, I fully agree with you that um, diversity needs to be accommodated. And um, in that sense, I completely side with, um, well, say, the, the ideas of constitutional pluralism. There is plurality of ideas, and that should be accommodated. The key question, obviously, then, is who has to accommodate it, right? So, and who can, gets to decide whether or not, in a given case, a certain values need to be accommodated if they deviate. I think that that is the question, and I think if you look at the modern way that the court applies the principle of primacy, that it still adheres to, it is a primacy of an EU law that in itself also accommodates diversity, but it is centralized and not decentralized and not unilateral, each constitutional court for itself um, deciding in which cases we go for diversity, identity, and in which case we go for commonality. So I would like to hear your view on that. Thank you. Yeah. Or, or we would have... Mm. 
no, I, I can answer uh, briefly uh, to your first uh, question. Um, of course, uh, common constitutional traditions, resources uh, for the creation of general principles of European law, and uh, it's not in the sense as direct source, but as indirect source through general principles. And uh, there is no, so to say, one-to-one um, -one, uh, introduction of, uh, of uh, the common constitutional um, traditions to the general principles, but uh, it is a source how to create these general principles. And that means um, it could be it called a general principle, so to say the g genesis of the general principle of European law could consist of two parts. The first part is a consolidated common constitutional tradition, and I explained in my uh, introductory remarks how we can uh, find out what is this common constitutional tradition, and then after that, then we know what is the common constitutional tradition, and I said already there's some um, shortcomings in the methodology, but anyway, we are doing that. And then we have this uh, knowledge, and then on the basis of the, this knowledge, uh, we are um, doing the cre creative job, and not to take, oh, this is a tradition, and we are introducing this in European law. There is this creative uh, moment, and then maybe it's not one-to-one, -one, but uh, it's one of the sources. I, I used the notion source in this indirect way. Uh, so, so the construction is as such as uh, we, we explained you and, and me now. Concerning the backsliding, Yes, it's a new uh, question, because it was not imaginable uh, mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. that uh, a backsliding could happen, because uh, we are also the wording of the treaties is more and more close union. Also, the direction is clear, and uh, less and less close union is uh, somehow against that, that treaty. Object and purpose. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, really, it could happen at, uh, at least on, on theoretical uh, level, and maybe also in, in reality. Um, how to deal with that on European level? Level, um, because of the indirect influence of a common constitutional tradition. So, if one one in one member state, there are some backsliding. We, of course, uh, I have, I will not analyze what means backsliding. Maybe this is also a very, so to say, delicate issue. But if we are assuming if there is a backsliding in one member state, that means automatically that the common constitutional tradition is changing. It changes. Uh, if there is a. Uh, the common constitutional tradition is uh, a fact, a cons consolidated fact in one, so to say, there we have 20 member states with such kind of tradition, maybe eight in that, uh, in, 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 in different tradition. That means it could be changed, the common constitutional tradition, in my view, could be changed by the change of constitutional situation in one or more member states, because it's a direct reflection. What is the common constitutional tradition? And then, uh, whether it would be direct influence to the general principle of European law depends from the second element uh, of creation of uh, general principle of European law, because the first element is this rather factual situation, what is the, what is, so to say. Rather, we can sociologically to see what is the 
uh, tradition in member states. If they change, we have see, yes, it's changing. But then the uh, creative moment uh, remains by the member, uh, by, uh, by the European Union institution, especially by the court. And the court is not supposed to follow this, um, this uh, changing tradition. Um, and it is free to ignore that or to react thus in, a, in a different way, and the result would be the general principle of European law, uh, which uh, it is not. Yeah, it is not directly depend. De uh, does not directly depend from the change of the constitutional si situation in one member state, because of this uh, uh, autonomous, creative moment in the process of creation or maintaining of the general principle of European law. A rather complicated answer, but I maybe I don't know whether it was clear enough. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so coming back to the diversity and the plurality um, sort of framework, uh, as I s once again to emphasize, I think that is uh, the strengths, the European strengths indeed. Yeah, and uh, we should find indeed the ways uh, to uh, um, sort of to use that strength. Uh, my uh, own sort of um, proposal uh, would be that, um, I mean, before, you know, we get to uh, sort of establishing that we indeed have something in common in terms of contents. And sort of the core is clear. We are all in, in, in agreement uh, on a certain uh, piece of uh, tradition. Uh, that will anyhow stem from the diversity, right? And so we need, at that moment, we need to institutionalize um, something which, um, where that diversity is put on the table. And so I see uh, the line as follows, uh, diverse constitutional traditions on an issue, and then you have a forum for a dialogue. So uh, if we are sort of serious about, um, well, every one of us and our societies, and that we want those societies to live together within a common, uh, within a certain framework, which is uh, European Union, then I think we should institutionalize dialogue with regards to these uh, uh, diverse constitutional traditions. And it is in this context that I put to, uh, uh, that I place the courts, the dialogue of the courts in the center of, well, that will not be the solution, but it is an important element of the solution, I would say. Now, if um, um, this uh, idea uh, we are having now together with the European Court, the Latvian Constitutional Court, and the European uh, uh, the, the, the Court of Justice, uh, we will try next year uh, in spring to sort of organize uh, a dialogue uh, of the Court of Justice and the Constitutional Courts um, in Riga. Uh, precisely to situate ourselves, you know, how that could work. Because um, there will be informal and formal methods how to address the diversity and channel that into a decision which will evidence, evidently evidence at the level of Court of Justice a particular piece of tradition that we say, yes, it's common to all of us, it's perfectly legitimate, it's been, you know, debated, dialogued, etc. We are happy, and that's what we are missing at the moment. Because, as I said, uh, we are all coming from always sort of on the top of the iceberg, and everyone said, oh, I'm supreme, so that's what I say is right, and uh, I'm supreme in Riga, and I what I say is right, you see. That doesn't lead us anywhere anymore. Uh, so we have to really change um, our sort of approaches and mindsets, and I think we are perfectly able to do that in Europe. So, diversity into a dialogue, and that's when you have a common uh, uh, tradition. But above all, it's really a question of gesture and emphasis, and the change in emphasis. So it is, a, it is this fine thing of a culture, of, uh, of dialogue, and 
and a, and a discourse. Not much needed when you come to think about it. It's all a question of personality. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for a very interesting presentation. It was a bit of a smorgasbord for a constitutional lawyer, so I will try to restrain myself <laughs> on, on touching on too many issues. But first, I, would, I just want to ask indeed, if we look at this, this collaboration, the method, uh, the court is usually starts by emphasizing that it is a collaborative effort with the national courts, but then increasingly you sense some form of hierarchy creeping into the, the decision making when it comes to the substance. Now, I fully understand that supremacy was necessary in the early days to simply get the system going and ensure effectiveness. And it was partially legitimated by the vision of an ever-increasing union, maybe even moving towards a constitutional federal entity. Now, if we see that both have changed, so we're no longer in the early days. The EU is an established order. It's mature. So do we still need this very strong concept? Or drawing a parallel to competition law, can we have something like 1-2003, where at some point you decide that European law is settled, and you can have further decentralization. You can have further trust in the, in the parties. And at the same time, we see that the underlying assumption has changed. I mean, um, I would argue that very few politicians are still full-blown federalists. Um, Guy Verhofstadt maybe um, still gets the credit for defending that camp. But if both the initial necessity and the underlying political justification have changed, would that not um, be a sign for the court to start looking for a more nuanced approach to supremacy? Um, for example, treating it indeed as a general principle that can be balanced against other principles, such as constitutional identity. Leaving it to national constitutional courts to indicate that uh, in 99.9% in .9 of cases we follow EU law, there's no problem with supremacy, but why not grant us this one piece of national identity? Because, to be honest, um, if we respect the German view on um, the, the human dignity, uh, or the French laïcité, that will not undermine the EU as a whole. So maybe, uh, is, it, is it indeed now time to become less protective um, and to accept that in a mature relation, indeed, you need the diversity? Um, secondly, uh, on, on the constitutional identities, I was just wondering, uh, it's indeed a, a problem of how to define what a constitutional identity is and, uh, and compare them. But how do you deal in terms of methodology also with the, the different weight? For example, 27 member states may agree on a constitutional issue, but it may be a relatively unimportant question for their constitution, whereas the outlier may consider it an extremely important, essential part of their constitutional identity. So how indeed do you assess relative weight to different traditions when comparing them instead of just saying it's numerical, 27 to 1? And maybe as a source of inspiration, if you cannot compare public international law and the, the rules for creating um, customary international law, could you draw some inspiration from federal systems where federal constitutional courts sometimes also have to do this exercise of comparing ident uh, constitutional traditions in their different states, which may be a closer analogy to the EU than the public international law? Thank you. More comments, and then we have a last round. Yeah, Anneli. You can pass on to, yeah. Yeah, as some of you may remember from yesterday, I also support the diversity division. So I was very interested to hear the practical suggestions that um, Justice Seaman had put forward. And um, in the ERC project that I mentioned, there is one uh, concrete suggestion to this effect from the former vice president of the Polish Constitutional Court, uh, um, Stanislaw Biernat, who wrote the report before the recent changes in Poland. And he suggests, and apparently this is based on widespread discussions amongst constitutional court judges over Europe and also with the, um, with the Council of Europe rule of law experts, uh, that constitutional courts in cases such as Lantowa should have a formal hearing um, uh, in front of the Court of Justice. In, in that case, the Court of Justice notably returned um, a letter of the Court of Justice of the Czech Constitutional Court back to the Constitutional Court. But in terms of diversity, I've recently noticed that quite a few scholars have started to uh, express concern about the 
effect of, on human rights in particular of EU law in that it displaces uh, national diversity and national systems. And they have started to see benefit in the uh, ECHR system, which uh, ensures the minimum flow, but then allows member states to uh, establish a higher level of protection. And amongst them, um, Scholars who have written about this are uh, Janneke Gerard, who is an eminent uh, Dutch uh, human rights lawyer, as well as uh, Thomas Kleinlein from Germany and uh, Alexander Sormek. And I wonder if this might be a way to accommodate diversity whilst also uh, you don't uh, support this view. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, all the answers that you've given before. And um, I would also like to continue the question about this uh, diversity, what uh, actually I think everyone agreed that it should be accommodated. But isn't there a risk that if it goes way too far that it can lead to the breaking up of uh, EU itself? Because uh, it should be like a certain border I would like to propose a mathematical solution to your problem. Uh, it, it depends on, on how you look at what are common constitutional traditions. And you can look at them as comparative law report. Or um, So that's what we do with the European Court of Human Rights. European Court of Human Rights writes to the Latvian Constitutional Court. We tell them the law in Latvia is like that. And then they compile a comparative law report, and they sometimes refer to that as European consensus, if there are enough countries. That's not a source of law. That might limit the margin of appreciation. So instead, this is legislative procedure. And if it is legislative procedure, then it is either customary international law or something else. And it is not customary international law because of constitutional diversity. In customary international law, each state has a possibility to declare itself a persistent objector. So here we go to uh, the professor's comment about uh, persistent objectors, the persons for whom this is very, very important. In EU, in EU law, this is not possible because of uniformity of EU law. So the only, the only solution is complete uniformity of constitutional traditions. So each member state's constitutional tradition needs to be aligned with all other member states' constitutional traditions. And you can only establish this not by means of research and division report, but by formal institutional response of constitutional courts of each state. So basically, the only way how constitutional traditions could be declared common and a source of law would be if each constitutional court of each member state would give a reverse advisory opinion on what the constitutional traditions are, and that's the only way how, how these traditions can be formed. Otherwise, it is imposing the will, and sometimes maybe not adequately researched and motivated will of the Court of Justice or the European Union on member states. And it is the matter of constitutional diversity, not sovereignty or misunderstood sovereignty. I also may may add something. Uh, continuing this uh, line of argument on legitimacy of decision making in the EU and the role of uh, European Court of Justice and dialogue between European Court of Justice and especially national constitutional courts, I would like uh, to return to the issue of trust, which we mutual trust, which we discussed yesterday and also mentioned in her presentation that there is actually a crisis of mutual trust in, in, e, in EU, and crisis of rule of law is basically uh, a consequence of this crisis of trust. Trust between uh, people in the EU member states and EU uh, in general, and between the EU institutions, including the court and EU member states. So basically, this, uh, to my opinion, this uh, enforced legal recognition of common values and fundamental rights protection 
uh, is uh, one of the venues how to increase or return trust in relations between, for example, EU institutions and Court of Justice and people in EU member states, because what the Court of Justice is doing is protecting their rights, which is uh, they have their rights protected under the rule of law. And the other issue is also uh, building trust between uh, EU uh, institutions and member states, because when there are all those cases where uh, respect towards national uh, uh, constitutional identities of member states are in front of the court, uh, then all member states are carefully watch watching how the court will react. And actually, in many cases, uh, like Cadi or Omega or Stand Wittgenstein, uh, also case law on independence of judiciary, there were many governments involved in those cases and also many governments watching how court will listen. And actually, court of justice listened very carefully what member states said and what were their constitutional co uh, concerns uh, about those issues. And I think that the dialogue between the courts is the right way to proceed and to define this common path of common values and common constitutional traditions. If you have replies to those comments, yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah. So on this very important point uh, about uh, the minimum standard of protection of human rights uh, as uh, ECHR provides for it and, and whether that could be any uh, guiding uh, example uh, within the um, sort of diversity, fundamental rights uh, debate uh, and development uh, within the EU. The reason I'm saying uh, it cannot uh, is because the European Union, in my mind, has gone beyond uh, already that stage of uh, providing for minimum level of fundamental rights. Um, I, well, at least we as far as constitutional court uh, is, is concerned, um, we are very fine uh, with the uh, main sort of uh, principle that uh, the idea of the European Union constitutionalism in, with regards to fundamental rights is to provide for more or, or higher degree of protection uh, of uh, those rights. So that, therefore, we are really um, in a, a situation where um, EU member states have gone beyond. We are building something. The difficulty is we are building new. Th it's a new thing you know, for uh, uh, 27, eight <laughs> states um, and societies being together and continuing to actually form a constitutional order. Uh, a constitutional order of a new kind, which will not be uh, the one that we know in our national states. Um, so, and where we, if we do accept that it is not uniformity imposed from above, despite the principles of the EU law, but it is the uh, uh, commonality that has been agreed upon through diversity and dialogue, if that's the nature of the European constitutionalism, then of course, yes, we need to bring in from different sources of inspiration, and federal states would be a very good example, uh, from different sources of inspiration, we need to bring in uh, these new informal and formal methods, uh, which in the end, to me, in the center, is really the, the informal and formalized dialogue which um, sort of uh, brings this this uh, higher level of, of uh, indeed protection of fundamental rights as well which does not exclude that domestic that constitutional courts can go even beyond that and uh, for example uh, Latvian constitutional court uh, on a number of issues notably when it comes to right to fair trial has a very high standard compared to uh, what exists elsewhere um, in, in Europe. So th that's sort of very quickly, um, and yes, and how to ensure the diversity doesn't uh, break apart the whole exercise. Well, I believe we really cannot, and there I will uh, side with uh, Judge Levitz already, because there were elements uh, of answer in that. 
in relation to the question of sliding back, so to say. No, um, I mean, EU legal order is there already with its principles, and uh, I think the common agreement is we have to maintain those principles. What we are looking for are really the ways of having um, sort of, you know, the more honest picture on, on where the constitutional traditions, what they are, uh, where they come from, how do we channel them, how do we agree on, so okay, this is, this is what we can agree on. The rest remains the diversity, the rest remains outside EU law, but uh, EU law uh, principles such as uh, autonomy, uh, I think is perfectly capable, and there I agree with you, of keeping it together um, given how far it has come, so I, I would not uh, have uh, that, that danger. And I'm sure you're dealing with Poland now in the Court of Justice. So, If I may offer um, a couple of points uh, that have been addressed, and I fully agree uh, with uh, Judge Zemele that when she said, and I think that it might have been a misunderstanding of, of yesterday's discussion, the discussion at least as I also see it uh, in, uh, in the Court of Justice, is not whether you should offer the lowest possible common denominator. So th this is not the same as in Strasbourg that should find the minimum common denominator. The purpose of the common denominator sought by the Court of Justice that this denominator should be high enough. So those who are falling back on the protection should bring their protection to the level which is high enough. But then the question remains, should we allow some to go even further? And this is where the question arises. But uh, there, are, there are a couple of very interesting points, and if we speak about the examples of Kadi and, and other cases where the governments intervene and offer protection, and this could be part of the problem and not the solution, because very often the governments, what the governments offer is a political position. Mm -hmm. And the constitutional courts may not necessarily agree on what the national law says. And this is where, the again, we speak not of the contribution, because the, the contribution, the dialogue between the governments and the, con the court of justice, there things work very well. There are procedural rules how the governments may intervene in any case and submit their observations. And this is where the problem is, that because sometimes the observations that they submit may not necessarily be in the best interest of the national legal system. And this is where the role of judiciary as an independent actor who speaks the law, not necessarily the political will, but speaks the law, uh, is, is somehow missing in the system. And uh, when we speak about the supremacy, it's not by accident that supremacy principle, although long-standing in, in the case law, did not find its way to the text of the treaty. There was a good reason. And if we look at the declaration, yes, the Council Legal Service disagreed with the political will of member states, but the political will of member states, I think this de declaration uh, uh, is, is a clear evidence that this is an issue in itself, but there is a problem with an extreme interpretation somehow. And it becomes of a particular importance nowadays uh, if we come put this together with the principle of autonomy of EU law. We need to understand that EU law is not something that exists only between member states and the court. We have a very vast area, and you've mentioned an excellent example of competition law, where we also have a big number of various fundamental rights issues, where EU law exists as an autonomous system to what the national rules are, because there are rules w which are applied by the national authorities, but then there are a different set of rules that is being applied by the Commission itself. And this is not the only example. This area is growing. There are big, we have an increasing number of areas. We will have the European Public Prosecutor's Office with the, with the protection of financial interests, where all criminal principles will come in. We have a very vast area with a big chunk of fundamental rights issue, which is civil service law where the Commission is the one, and the European Union institutions are the one, applying their principle, principles of seemingly EU law in a complete detachment of what the national traditions say. 
So we, and this is less the Court of Justice, we as the General Court are asked to interpret this principle. And if we interpret them in full detachment for what the national traditions say, and only on the basis of what the Commission sometimes suggests, we arrive at very, 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 very different result as to what it was or would have been had that issue been brought before the National Court. And if we took the, take this principle only from the perspective of national autonomy, and this becomes something that is embedded in jurisprudence and then applied across the board in other areas because we are advised or we are asked to treat the question that hasn't been treated before, so we look by analogy which principles we can apply. And if we have to look in the box, for example, civil service law, uh, where we have already said something on, simply on the basis of the Commission's regular argument, this is our political discretion, we do this because we do this. And we see that member states have gone long way forward. There is a problem. There is a problem. And this is why you need to look simply beyond the, the preliminary reference proceedings to understand how the, the European law evolves and especially when it comes to fundamental rights, it is far beyond what you find in a preliminary reference. And you need to look into the arguments of the European Union institutions in other cases to understand where is this diverging point between EU, its independent political will, which may not necessarily be the will of, uh, of the member states of the constitutional traditions, because they cannot be a complete detachment we, as a European institution, apply some principles. You, as member states, apply other principles. This is where the, the autonomy of EU law should not exist. This is where it should be a synergy. So, um, speaking in general terms, we are trying now to, to uh, reconciliate two contradictory uh, goals or principles, unity and diversity. They are in principle contradictory. And um, so it is, um, I think one colleague said that it is 99.9% uh, .9 of similarity or unity, but it should remain uh, one or less than 1% of diversity. I, uh, I have a little bit uh, diff uh, difficult position because I, in principle, agree with you, but this is not the uh, general uh, policy of the European Court of Justice. Um, I think that, um, indeed, uh, to, um, to, um, to achieve a uniform solution in absolutely all cases, creates also not only judicial problems, but also political problems, especially acceptance of the European Union. That means uh, there was mentioned also national identity and, or constitutional identity. National identity, I think, is a little bit broader term, includes also cultural aspects. And, um, and uh, whether uh, and the national identity or constitutional identity issues are, in principle, relevant for one member state. It is not necessary to have the 27 or 20 or two member states. It's enough for one member state that the specific issue is an issue for this member state, but not for other member states, a problem of constitutional identity. In principle, on uh, the European Court of Justice is reacting to this question uh, uh, reasonably, and we are saying, for example, in uh, in case Sein Wittgenstein or in uh, in case uh, Vardin, uh, it was uh, it was uh, for one member state very important issue issue for this member state uh, as a national identity issue. And we are not asking further whether it's the same for other member states or for a group of member states. It's enough. So that means it is a 
appreciation for appreciation exact of the on on the importance of this issue for the respective member state. We are doing this appreciation and if we are coming to a solution to, to the result, yes, it's very important for that member state, then uh, Article uh, 4, uh, Paragraph uh, 3 uh, or 2 uh, concerning national identity would be applied. Um, the question is um, that, um, that um, it's possible for member states sometimes uh, to say, maybe especially in vis-a-vis -vis to this result, to say, no, it was not uh, necessary before, but now it is a constitutional issue for us. And on this way, somehow to circumvent the, also the unity element in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, saying by saying that this is exact for us a national identity issue. Therefore, it is necessary for the European Court of Justice to look a little bit deeper when the member state is saying national identity issue, also to see whether this element has some, also I would say now, in, uh, historical roots, or it's the first time National, the state is discovering for the first time, oh, this is a national identity issue for us in order to win uh, the case. Also, uh, this, uh, some seriosity, I would say, uh, should be or is asked for, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, putting forward national identity uh, principle. But, uh, but I agree with you that um, it is better for the acceptance of the European Union, better for the political atmosphere, but also for, uh, for the legal system of the European Union to leave more space for national uh, diversity, especially in, uh, when national uh, constitutional or national identity is at stake. So that means normally uh, so, so the, the classical approach of the European law is that the European law is, uh, has primacy also over the Constitution. This is an approach. Um, the most constitutional courts uh, are saying, this is a position that uh, maybe in principle yes, but not over the constitutional core. This is a notion and idea of constitutional core. That means there is a division of the importance of the, constitu of the whole constitution in a constitutional court, uh, core and the rest of the constitution. And for the national constitutional court, maybe it's uh, relatively easier, more easier to say uh, there is a primacy over the rest of our con constitution, but not the primacy uh, over the constitutional core. Um, there is still now not such an issue discussed by the European Court of Justice uh, where the member state is saying this is national constitutional core and therefore primacy is, should not be applied. Uh, there are some, in some kinds, this Czech, uh, Czech uh, decision, it was not argued with constitutional court, but it said simply that uh, Luxembourg court is uh, going ultra virus. But I think if such a more precise and more reasonable, also not only from le legally, legal point of view, but also from political point of view, should be put forward, this is our constitutional court, it's serious, then European Court of Justice should uh, step back, I would say, uh, to respect that uh, in, in any case. Even the price would be that uh, in some cases there would not be absolute uniform application of European law. For example, if in one member state this is a problem of national constitutional core, but in 27 other member states, no, that, uh, that means there would be an ex exemption. Uh, I would say that the price is not too high for me, personally, 
not too high uh, in order to, uh, to, to get a better acceptance of the European Union, which is much more needed if the Union is broader as, uh, as uh, originally six member states. Um, but it is a judicially political decision. We have not such a case till now, but uh, if we would have, I would say it would be reasonable to argue in this way.